Sandra, welcome to Jed's Business School. Look forward to hearing you talk to us about good energy policy today. Great to be here today to talk about behavioral science and energy policy. Um, I was hoping you could start by telling us a little bit about what role social psychology has or behavioral science has in informing good energy policy or energy efficiency policy in general. Yeah, so I think social psychology and perhaps behavioral science more generally has the advantage of looking at how humans actually make decisions and behave in real world context. So sometimes in policy we often have these if-then assumptions. If people behaved in a certain way or if they were completely logical or rational, then we would expect uh, a particular outcome. But we don't always test how people behave and make decisions in the sort of social everyday situations that people find themselves in. So I think experiments that we do in psychology and behavioral science on energy consumption and how can we get people to reduce their energy consumption, for example, give us an idea of the types of interventions that we could implement uh, on a population level to help scale um, the sort of behavioral effects um, that we see at the individual level in terms of reducing energy consumption that actually have large-scale uh, policy consequences. So I think social psychology can help in sort of thinking through the types of interventions that would actually help reduce overall energy consumption. But more importantly, perhaps, we can also think about policy impacts and whether or not people support certain policies. Uh, different people have different values, different worldviews, different political ideologies, and so we can think about um, bottom-up support for policies. If you implement a policy without public approval, that can go very wrong, of course. There's lots of historical examples of where people didn't actually support a policy or not cooperative with the policy. Um, so psychology can offer insights there. Um, and perhaps for the, for the skeptics out there, I think at the end of the day, people who are crafting policies are people too. Um, if they don't support good energy policy, if they don't care about the future of the planet, um, that's going to affect the types of policies that will gain support in those circles. So I think ultimately at the end of the day, it's people making policies, it's policies affecting people, and people are also part of the problem. So for me, social psychology and behavioral science are crucial to energy policy. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about you know, why this particular topic is of interest to you and, and what you hope to contribute. So I started thinking about this uh, many years back when I was interested in social dilemmas, which essentially is a situation where um, if everyone acted in the collective interest, we'd all be better off, but we often find that at the individual level, people make decisions that are in their own self-interest. And if everyone does that, then it's hard to, to sort of uh, you know, get anywhere in terms of fixing the big problems that we're facing today. Um, and I think environmental problems, including energy policy, is a prime example um, of that. So this is where, where I came from and sort of investigated how we can get people to cooperate in these sort of dilemma situations where we have to balance what's good for ourselves versus what's good for society. And then I often found that prescriptions that were made in, in, in policy, in, in, in public policy on some of these issues, such as the use of extrinsic incentives like rewarding people with financial rewards or tax rebates, um, actually had peculiar effects sometimes on people's behavior. So, uh, for for example, we, we do an experiment where we'd evaluate uh, energy consumption on a university campus. So we had all students, it was a competition, um, so we'd all students participate in this challenge to reduce their energy consumption. They were competing uh, against each other. And the campaign itself was successful, so you might say, okay, competition, market forces, sort of that's, that's effective. Um, but interestingly, as soon as the competition ended, so that people's sort of good energy uh, behavior and people went back to doing what they were doing before the campaign started. And so that primed me to think about, well, how useful are those type of incentives? Because if people were motivated on their own uh, to reduce their energy consumption without sort of an extrinsic incentive, maybe, that, uh, maybe people would sustain that behavior longer um, and perhaps create a positive feedback loop that if something, if we engage in morally virtuous behaviors, which we know people enjoy doing, and you get a positive sort of feedback from that that then stimulates uh, further engagement in that behavior, rather than sort of uh, think about a Skinner box, if you will, sort of dangling goodies in front of people. And we can get people to, to cooperate when we do that, but it's very costly because you have to pay people, and it tends to only last for as long as the extrinsic incentive is, is put in place, and that's sort of the downside. Uh, uh, to some of these initiatives. So that's sort of where I started thinking about the insights from, from psychology and the use of incentives in policy making around energy. Could you tell us a bit more about some of the specific experiments that, that you've been involved in? So the experiment was about social norms in a way. Uh, the competition itself was contrasting 
uh, the norm of different colleges at the university campus because they're competitive and so we were displaying uh, energy consumption in real time on apps uh, for students and they could see how well their college was doing and we initially thought that social norms are a good way to get people to reduce energy consumption because people are social beings, we care about the opinions of others. Um, and what's peculiar about that intervention is that in a way social norms are extrinsic incentives too. Uh, so we care about the behavior of others when, when it's visible, when it's salient and, and, and focal in attention for us. Uh, but, but when it's not, when we go back to our private behaviors and we don't see other people uh, reducing their energy consumption, we tend to go back to, we revert back to our uh, unsustainable consumption patterns uh, at, as well. And so this was a university-wide competition. We recorded actual energy consumption. We had meters on buildings to see how much energy the uh, different buildings were, uh, were consuming. And it was sort of a quasi-experiment because we looked at the trend before the campaign started, during as well as afterwards to see if there were changes in the, in the trends, in the energy consumption trends. And so we found that energy was increasing before the campaign. During the campaign, there was a steep decrease. But then as soon as the campaign ended, uh, people sort of reverted back to, to what they're doing before. And there's been a lot of experiments um, in that arena. For example, some interesting experiments show that when you pay people to save energy, uh, it might actually backfire in the sense that uh, you're diluting the pro-sociality, the purity of the act for people. So we like doing things that are good because it sends a positive self-signal. But when you now pay me to do something virtuous, it actually kind of feels like uh, you're neutralizing uh, the goodness of the act in a way. And so there's a lot of experiments that actually show that when you pay people to reduce energy consumption, that can have unintended consequences. Uh, whereas if you use other what we call intrinsic motivation, so things people intrinsically care about, such as their, their own health and well-being and the health and well-being of the community. When you say, well, if you reduce energy consumption, it will help clean up the air, reduce asthma problems, and, and things like that. People are much more motivated uh, by these sort of collective frames, uh, sometimes uh, than pure financially-based uh, rewards. And, and then if you could tell us a little bit specifically about the warm glow experiment that you've done. Yeah, so there's been a lot of research that shows that when people do something environmental, they feel good about themselves afterwards. But I was thinking, well, it would be much more interesting to actually find out if people anticipate that doing good in a way and reducing their energy consumption will make them feel good um, in, a, in a much more anticipated sense. Because that could help us predict, well, is it that people do something and then feel good afterwards? Is it really that people anticipate that doing so would make them feel good and that, that is the motivating factor that drives people uh, to reduce their energy consumption? So we did a sort of a national sample of, uh, of people in the United Kingdom, asked them a range of, of questions in time one, including um, some, some questions about how they estimate how good they would feel about engaging in a, in a long range of, uh, of different behaviors. Uh, and then four weeks later, we followed up with the same individuals and asked them about all sorts of behaviors. And we found very interestingly that this anticipated warm glow was indeed predictive of a range of energy consumption behaviors. But then when we looked at the results more closely, we found that it was particularly related to sort of the easier, low-cost changes that people can adopt, switching light bulbs and things like that, and much less so of more costly actions like switching to, to a green energy provider. Um, so I do think it's important that people experience this warm glow, but perhaps the next question is how far we can really stretch that warm glow in terms of uh, making costly changes. It's of course perfectly reasonable for people to start thinking more about, well, this is very difficult, it's going to cost me a lot of money, and so other things come into play more um, when we ask a lot from people, and I think this sort of interesting dichotomy between um, when people experience warm glow and how far they're willing to go to, to help the environment and reduce energy consumption is an interesting question. So if you had a minute or two with the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, what would you convey to them? What, would, what sort of key points do you think that they would need to either change existing policies or, or, or think about new policies? I would make two key points to policymakers. I think one is that there's this predominant assumption, the norm, what we call the norm of self-interest, which is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we tell people that people are self-interested, they'll behave in a way that's self-interested, which perpetuates the norm. But in fact, 
loads of research in psychology and behavioral science, including my own, shows that people often want to help people intuitively cooperate in situations where they're asked to contribute to, to the public good. And there's loads of evidence that people are willing to help. And that entire area is untapped. Uh, in a way. So we've not tapped people's intrinsic motivation to contribute to some of these initiatives because we assume that people are self-interested and that we need to reward them in order for them to cooperate. And I think we need to shift that frame and recognize, well, yes, yeah, sometimes financial rewards and extrinsic incentives are useful, but at other times we don't want to undermine in fact, people's own motivation to help. We don't want to crowd out, as we call it, uh, people's goodwill uh, to help the environment. Because with these issues, we sort of have to adopt a long, a long term frame, right? In the end, it's about changing people's fundamental thinking about their relationship with the planet and reducing energy consumption. Um, and so when incentives only work in the short term, that's not going to engage people in the long term. So I think that's, that's part of it. The other part is that sometimes it's not clear how behavioral science can help. Um, but in fact, when you scale small changes that we find in people's behavior across millions of households that can actually add up to large-scale policy relevant effects. So for example, in a typical social norm intervention, we see that displaying the behavior of other people in a favorable way helps people reduce their own consumption because they see what's normative. People want to conform to the norm, which is very natural. And then we see effects of maybe 1%, 2% uh, reduction in energy consumption. And something you can ask, okay, what does that amount to? Um, but in these interventions, where you look at hundreds of thousands of households, when you scale 1, 2% across millions of people, that can actually um, add up. Uh, the same goes with, with voting behavior. Interventions that encourage people to, to actually go out and do their civic duty and participate in these type of initiatives, you see you know, 5% increase in verified voter turnout with the sort of small changes in wording, which are extremely cost effective. Um, and you might wonder, okay, what, is, what does that do? Um, well, if, you, if you're talking about a district with hundreds of thousands of people, then getting a few thousand people out to vote can actually make a difference between voting for a good energy policy, depending on our definition of good, uh, um, or an unsustainable policy. Uh, and so in a way, again, uh, I think in a lot of ways the power of behavioral science is underestimated in policy and I think policies could generally benefit from a more accurate representation of how humans make decisions based on randomized controlled trials about how people actually make decisions and behaviors in the real world and I guess that's what social psychologists and behavioral scientists work on. Thanks again, Sandra. I really appreciate this. Uh, I think it maybe even convinced some of us skeptics. My pleasure. <laughs>